lot of us in the 15th Air Force were too busy holding down our end of the war when it happened. But over at Barry Airport, there was quite a show going on. It was the 31st of August, 1944. Those forts coming in were finishing a job we had started last spring. They were bringing back a lot of our people who'd been gone for quite a while. 24 hours ago, these boys were bivouacking behind Nazi barbed wire. Just 24 hours ago, they were prisoners of war. Now they were free. And now, we were shaking hands with fellas we thought we'd never see again. It was just one of those days. Some of these Joes were so glad to get back, they hit that Italian dust with a four-point landing. And when that GI planted a smacker on the first MP he saw, well, that about did it. All of these crew members were shot down or made a crash landing in the target area. Most of them walked away from it. Others weren't so lucky. There was no American quartermaster where these men were, so they made themselves a few private deals. Raunchy Romanian Air Force caps, gypsy peasant hats, Heine helmets, even civvies. And like all good tourists, they had a handful of souvenirs. The Iron Cross was the most popular gadget. They even made room on their T.O. for a postmaster. Yes, that was a day for the records. It belongs in this family album of the 15th Air Force. That was the day General Twining took time out from the war. You could tell from the way he talked to these men how proud he was of the job they had done and how thankful he was to have them back again. For their return rang down the curtain on one of the roughest shows ever put on by the 15th. You won't have much trouble remembering it. Ploiesti. Ploiesti. The name still makes us nervous. That's the kind of a target it was. From our bases in southern Italy, across the Adriatic, over the Yugoslav mountains, to the valley of the Blue Danube, and high over the Romanian plain to Ploiesti. A target we came to know better than our own hometown. 600 miles one way, across hostile territory to Hitler's oil barrel, to Ploiesti. 19 square miles of oil refineries, tank farms, marshalling yards, boiler houses, pipelines, and cracking plants. Processing more than 700,000 tons of crude oil a month, one-third of all the oil feeding the Nazi war machine. And that meant lubricating oil, gun oil, gasoline, kerosene, diesel oil, paraffin, machine grease, aviation gasoline. The Nazis could make synthetic fuels, but lubricating oil has to come from natural petroleum. And one of the richest sources of natural petroleum was at Ploiesti. Obviously, the Hun was going to use everything he had in the book to defend these oil resources. You remember, one day, General Spots and Eker flew in for a little session with General Twining. We didn't know it then, but that was the beginning. Big business was underway. And then there was another day. Of course, we weren't in on it. But at headquarters, General Twining and his staff were in a pretty deep huddle. Gentlemen, you've just received a new directive establishing target priorities for the bomber offensive of the 15th Air Force. Destruction of the German Air Force will continue to be top priority. However, the high command now feels that we have already established air superiority for the enemy that will permit us to initiate full-out efforts against other target systems. The decision has been announced. We will destroy oil refineries and synthetic oil plants. Now, Colonel Young, what does our intelligence show us in regard to these targets within our area? More than 50% of the refineries and synthetic plants producing gasoline for the Axis are within range of the 15th Air Force. Between 25 and 30% of the total Axis production of gasoline is represented by the 10 large refineries around Ploeste. While these refineries were seriously damaged in the attack last August by the task force operating from Egypt, 
Recent photo reconnaissance reveals that, with one exception, all refineries are currently operating at full capacity. Tell you, Bert Potter, it's a big job we've got ahead of you. Knock out a Pulaski means the German will be deprived of one third of his oil resources. This conference was translated into quick action. Intelligence, supply, weather, operations. Starting 5 April, the campaign against Ploesti was on. None of us knew what it would take to lick it, but we did know that until it was flattened, we were in for a long grind. The air siege of Ploesti had begun. Sometimes the forts would lead, sometimes the 24s were out in front. And although Jerry's flak and fighters often punched holes in our formations, he never turned his back. Over the Adriatic, climbing to altitude, Unfreeze guns. Try a few bursts. Now we're up to 14,000. We lack a lot of daylight between us and the Jerry Akak on the Dalmatian coast. Flak vests go on. Fashionable for bomber crews. Healthful, too. Cross the Yugoslav mountains, still climbing. Mighty pretty scenery. The peaceful foothills that roll to the Danube Valley peaceful until they suddenly erupted with flak. Most of us were veterans by the time the Ploiesti show started. During that winter, we'd been over Regensburg, Steyr, Budapest, Gior, Wiener Neustadt, Vienna. Those targets had been plenty rough going, but we always went through. If that's called a baptism of fire, we'd had it. We were ready for Ploiesti. But don't get the idea that we were cocky. It doesn't take long in this business to learn that there are no milk runs. When we saw our top cover, it always looked mighty good. And when our fighter escort came in sight, well, to us, that was life insurance. But one thing we knew, whenever our fighters join up, it's just a question of time before the Heinies get in the neighborhood. And brother, they did. They started coming in all around the clock. out that the Luftwaffe was having a tough time replacing the Jerry's we shot down. Every mission to Ploiesti added names to Goering's Bureau of Missing Persons. But one thing we learned early, you don't get into that Ploiesti show without paying admission. It's 30 below zero up here, but the Jerry has a way of warming things up. And the closer to target, the warmer it gets. Black mushrooms were growing thicker in Flak Alley on every trip. And more accurate, too. As if things weren't already tough enough for us, the Jerry gave us another headache. Smoke pots. And for the bombardier in the front office, that smoke screen was a little extra chore to sweat out, in addition to his other duties. leaving that target behind. But we were still a long way from that donut line back at base. Right now, we had other things on our mind. Would our escort pick us up before the Jerry's jumped us again? Would the weather pile up between here and home? And what about those mountains? They were sure going to seem much higher looking at them through a feathered prop. That's how it was, and it never got any easier. The first six missions cost Hitler a lot of sea coupons. 
from a capacity of 700,000 tons of crude oil per month, we reduced Ploiesti's production 317,000 tons, a cut of 44%. It was a good start, but only a start. And after every mission, those of us who made it home knew that as soon as the weather was right, we'd be heading straight back to Ploiesti again to hammer it and get hammered. Back home, a donut used to mean dunking. Over here, it meant dining. Every time we bucked that donut line, it meant we'd buck that target again. Sometimes, the fellas we'd had breakfast with that morning didn't always get back for donuts. Funny thing about Ploiesti, it sort of got into your skin. After we worked it over from the air, it got a treatment on the ground. We ate it, slept it, convalesced from it. Down at Barry headquarters, the meeting of the operations planning section began every day at 11. But on this day, 8 June, the problem of smoke screens over Ploiesti, still a big headache of the 15th, came in for some special treatment by A3. Operations reckoned it was time for a change in tactics. We knew from experience that when our recce boys were over Ploiesti, the Nazis never smoked it up. They had always discounted fighter planes as bombing menace. They knew our 38s were over there to take pictures. But what they didn't know was that our 38s now packed a long-range punch, that they'd been modified to carry belly tanks and heavy bombs. We're going to dive bomb Romano Americano tomorrow using P-38. miles of buzzing and this was one time that nobody was going to be chewed out for it today it was an order up to bombing altitude there goes the last of the belly tanks target going down two weeks, bad weather forced us to raise the siege. During this time, the Hun at Ploiesti had been working fast. Intelligence told us how they were repairing damage, improving the smoke screen, increasing the ak, -ak. But we were busy too. New techniques for blind bombing, offset and synchronous pathfinder were being perfected. That smoke screen had to be licked. Beginning 23 June and through 10 August, we slugged at Ploiesti for another eight rounds. Now the bombers were getting a well-deserved break. Long-range fighter escort could run interference all the way to the target and back. It was during this period that the fighters took on the best of the Balkan-based Luftwaffe and cleaned them out of the skies. come up, the pea shooter boys went down and plastered him in his own front yard. Over the target, the bombers put the newly developed methods to work. For offset and synchronous pathfinder, all we needed were certain visible checkpoints to get a bead on our target.
Usually, to us, Ploiesti looked like this. And to the Nazis, it looked like this. We didn't know until later from captured German films how hot we really made it for the Heine. sooner did they put the fires out when large labor battalions began salvage and repair. They never stopped trying to patch up that oil barrel. Of course, we had a little patching up to do ourselves. Our bombers had really had it. We never stopped wondering how 165 pounds of guts and skill could bring home 30 tons of beaten up hardware. Jack was getting rougher, more accurate. Business was booming in Flack Alley. Not all of the boys walked away from those crash landings. By the middle of August, the production from Hitler's oil barrel had been reduced to 144,000 tons per month. The knockout meant the roughest work was still ahead. Down at Air Force Headquarters, the boss called a meeting of the wing commanders. We hoped this was the huddle that would close the deal on Ploiesti. I've called you in today to discuss future air operations against Ploiesti oil refinery. This strategical air force, during the next three days, will attack continuously, night and day, with maximum effort against all refineries in the area. 17 August. Now, with only a couple of the refineries left to polish off, Jerry knew just where we were going to strike. He pulled in his guns from the knocked out areas, concentrated them around the remaining targets, and laid it on the skyline for us. And even when we were chopping the unseen heart out of him, he wasn't doing us any good. While the ground crews were giving our bombers that all-night workout, the RAF were setting up to fly the night shift. And before the Wimpies were cooled off, we were warming up. Morning, 18 August. Operations really called it when they said this would be a round-the-clock show. If the fires we started that day kept burning, the RAF boys wouldn't have much trouble finding their target that night. They didn't. The RAF weren't the only ones on the night shift. Back at our fields, the ground crews were also on a mission. Not the kind the folks back home read about, but one that counts mighty big in this game. It was the way the ground crews hit the ball that kept us in business. Morning again, 19 August. Not that the flak would have been any less or the mission easier but it would have given us quite a thrill that day. If only we'd known this was the last time we ever had to bomb Ploiesti. It would have given us even more of a thrill if we could have seen this. We didn't know we were that good. It made you think of a graveyard. The graveyard of one-third of Hitler's oil. It was a quiet place now, very quiet. But the stillness of Ploiesti traveled far, to the beaches of Normandy, to the coast of southern France, to the Rhine, to Berlin. The clank of Tiger tank treads was not as loud as before. The U-boat boys were spending more quiet evenings at home. The rumble of traffic on Germany's superhighways was becoming a murmur. The roar of the Luftwaffe became a sigh. That's how this stillness of Ploiesti was heard. That's how strategic bombing pays off. We lost more than 2,300 men. But we got more than 1,400 of them back. These were the first. And the general made it pretty plain how glad he was to have his men back again. 
Yes, it was quite a show that day at Barry Airport. And now these men were back in the trucks again, headed out for another mission. Only this time, their IP would be the Statue of Liberty. Thank you.